One Brahman Kurma named Kurma invited him to the house. And Kurma Brahma was so happy that Lord Chaitanya came to his house. He offered a seat, he offered him prayers, washed his feet, offered him some food. And he said, I cannot calculate how fortunate. The same feet that Brahma and Shiva and all the sages and rishis are aspiring to meditate upon, those same two feet, the feet that Lakshmi Devi is eager to serve, they are in my home. <coughs> Today I consider my, my body, my life, my wealth, my family, my everything to be perfectly successful. Because you have come here to accept my service. And then he said, I am <coughs> suffering miserably due to the waves of material suffering. I want to leave this world and come with you. Sometimes when people say, I'll oh, leave everything and join, we say, oh, but you don't stay. Sometimes it is what it is. But we have to understand time, place, and service. Kurma Brahman was going to leave his family, his children, and join Lord Chaitanya because he said, I cannot tolerate the waves of material miseries anymore. And he was a wealthy man. And he had a really pious, loving family. He had everything everybody wants, but he was still suffering. And because of his intelligence, he realized there's no way out. I'm just going to leave it all. And he obviously thought that those words of renunciation were going to make Lord Chaitanya But Lord Chaitanya was very grave. He said, Never speak like that. <laughs> to be the servant of the servant, compassion toward others, and to always be taking shelter in Krishna's name. He said, if you just do this, there is no danger. There will be no distraction in living your life where you are. <coughs> Just do this. I will always be with you. He said, I will return to this place. In fact, I will never leave this place. I will always be with you. We will be together. If you just chant these names and share this blessing with others. Then Lord Chaitanya the next morning 
Goswami said that was the instruction Lord Chaitanya gave to everyone wherever he went in the Sakhani. Now, no doubt there were some serious renunciants. He told the Lord Sanatana, leave this place and go to Vrindavan. He told Gopal Bhatta, and Sri Ramana, he said, serve your parents as long as they're living, and then but don't get entangled in the meanwhile. This world, because they're great Vaishnavas, go to Vrindavan, join Rupa and Sanat, be a Goswami. So, for some people, he actually inspired them to a life of renunciation for the higher purpose of devotional service. But for most people, Lord Chaitanya instructed <coughs> just carry on with your duties in this world and put Krishna in the center. By chanting his name and serving his devotees and being compassionate to others. That was the general principle of how he instructed almost everyone. One time in Islam there was a, there was a serious conflict between the sannyasis and the Grihas. It's quite famous. Basically, certain sannyasis who were very empowered people, they were going to temples. And most of the temple presidents were grihastas. And they were secretly preaching to the brahmacharis. You're not going to make any advancement serving under grihastas. You should leave the temple and join us. And the brahmacharis, how could they refuse an offer like that from a famous sannyasi? So one Grihasta president, he told me the story. He was the president of this very serious temple in America. And, and the, uh, the sannyasis came and were you know, eating their food and preaching, and then they left. And when they left, all the brahmacharis all of a sudden were not there anymore. And how did they leave? They would tell them, they would say, you know, go out to distribute books at the parking lot like any other day. And we'll pick you up there. <laughs> so we'll just secretly bring whatever's valuable that you want to take with you and take it out for your book distribution today. We'll pick you up. And the Brahmacharya will go out on book distribution and never come back. And the president is going, where is he? Where is he? And then like some weeks later they find out he's traveling on a bus with the Sannyasis. So anyways, this one president from the Boston Temple. It's a real snow. And you know, all the brahmacharis go out. And by the time the sannyasis left, there was no brahmacharis left in the temple. So you know what he did? He called up the sannyasis and said, you know, there's nothing left here. Can I join you too? And I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> So he joined the party too. Yeah, we'll accept the Oscars too. <laughs> Anyways, this was creating some. Um, it wasn't such a cooperative effort. So the Oscars presidents complained to Sri Prabhupada. This is what these people are doing. And, and then the Sannyasis were saying to Prabhupada, you know, we want to save these people, these brahmacharis from the cycle of birth and death. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing. So both were convinced that they were doing what Prabhupada wanted. 
So now he says, and this, yes, this is what Prabhupada wants. He wants the brahmacharis to really think the brahmacharis would do this. And the Kriyas says, what does mean? No, that for sure Prabhupada wants them to maintain these temples otherwise. So it's a Mayapur. Mayapur festival. That it came to a culmination. The Grihastas are talking to Prabhupada. Sagasis are talking to Prabhupada. Each one convinced that they're right. And ultimately, they all had to accept what Srila Prabhupada was going to say. And almost everybody thought that Prabhupada was going to side with the singers. So Prabhupada totally took the side of the Grihasras. <laughs> and I remember, because I was, I was living on that muddy old mountain I talked about the other day. I was listening to a tape of Sri Lanka while I was dressing the Jeep. And it's a morning walk in Sri Lanka <coughs> during this conflict. And I'm listening to you, what's happening in this conflict because people are, the you know, sannyasis are presenting their views and the pastors are really pretty humble presenting their views. Because you know, sannyasis have done this. <laughs> <laughs> and Shri Prabhupada said, he gave 
some really nice examples. Do I have time to say that? Yeah. Yeah. He's, he said, who is better? Rupa Goswami or Ramananda Rai? <laughs> who is better? Swarup Damodar Goswami or Shivananda Singh? Who is better? Raghunath Goswami or Nityananda Prabhu? Nityananda was a Kriyasa. He was kind of going through the list. He said, Ramananda Rai is one of the three most confidential associates of Lord Shivananda. And he's a Kriyasa. And another one of the three is Swarup Damodar Goswami. He's a Sanyasi. Which one is the right? Sanatana Goswami left everything to be a renunciant. Nityananda Prabhu had two wives. Everybody, even the greatest sannyasis, worshipped Adolita Charya. And he had Sita Thakurani and six children. Shivananda saying he had several children, a wife. Srivast Thakur had a wife, <coughs> Malini, and Lord Chaitanya was telling him, I am your family, I am your property. Vasudev Dutt was the guru of the guru of Raghunath Das Goswami. Vasudev Dutt was a great hustler. Raghunath Das Goswami was the first guru of renunciation. Who's better? They're both better. <laughs> Not only are all better, they're all best. Because they were completely immersed in emotional service. So Srila Prabhupada saw that his three hostels were completely surrendering their lives to his loving service. And they were perfect association. And he sided with the three hostages. Told the sannyasis, leave you, give these people back to the temples and let them be there. This is my wish. So what is renunciation? Renunciation is not about changing our circumstance, it's about changing our hearts. Sometimes, you know, sometimes among renunciates there's an ego where people are fighting against each other. And sometimes they get, I mean, Brihastas do the same thing. Where there's the absence of that. Where there's cooperation and a higher level of humility for the, for the renunciation of our egos for the purpose of the mission. That's actual renunciation. political orientation toward materialistic politics to get our ways, backstabbing dishonesty. That's just totally materialistic ego, that's all. You can separate it in so many different garments and make it seem like it's, it's pure emotional service. The real renunciation means Tendency to find faults with us. No mundane political agenda, no ulterior motives. Real renunciation is the desire to see everyone prosper, while at the same time sticking to the situation. And knowing well whether we have things or whether we don't have things. Nothing is ours. The beekeeper's going to come and take it all away. Maybe today. He may have done it yesterday. He's definitely going to come tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> At the latest. So why should we be attached? Sri Prabhupada 
explains false renunciation in so many ways. He said, one man, he has, he has his wealth in a plate. And he's going home to enjoy it. And then a big wind comes. <laughs> it blows it off the plate. And it's all in the air and it's gone. And then as it's in the air gone, he says, Krishna, I offer it to you. I offer it to you. <laughs> <laughs> We should offer it while we have it with love. Not after it's taken away and say, okay, Krishna, okay, it's here. <laughs> I'm so renounced. <laughs> king Pratapurudra was the king of Orissa, and he was renounced as any sannyasi because he used everything in Lord Chaitanya's service. And Rabbana Bhaskoswami, what this is the meaning of his renunciation? He just saw everything should be for Krishna. Even when he took his diet, was enough buttermilk that fits in the palm of his hand, a little leaf pop of buttermilk. And while he would take it, once a day, it would take him a couple seconds to drink this little leaf cup of buttermilk. He would be thinking, let's see how condemned I am and wasting so much time just to enjoy my senses every day. He would imitate that. And that's the way he was feeling. Everything belongs to Krishna. Every moment belongs to Krishna. How I should use every moment for Krishna. So I'm reading nice prasad and I'm thinking I'm taking this prasad. Bhakti Vinod's Thakur and his prayer. We take this prasad to our full satisfaction. But we're completely conscious that it's the gift of Krishna. It's the mercy of Krishna. And it's being used to energize us to serve Krishna. When that's our meditation, taking prasad is pure devotional service. <clears throat> that's one way of looking at it. But rather not just looking at it from another way. Spending eating, I'm wasting this time to drawing my senses. <laughs> Three seconds. What a perfectionist he was. He was he was bowing down minimum to two thousand devotees every day. It was a regular principle. He would bow down to devotees two thousand times a day. That means full done in us. He would bow down to Krishna minimum 1,000 times a day. And he would chant at least 200,000 names of Krishna. And he would do parikram with Gopalan Hill every day. And it described he didn't have time to sleep more than at the most one and a half hours a day. And many days he just didn't have time to eat. Fit that in Yes? And yet, when he took those few seconds to drink the buttermilk, he was condemning himself by wasting so much time. <laughs> we can't imitate. But that was the standard of his renunciation. <clears throat> it could be like that. That's another thing. But from Lord Chaitanya's perspective, she went on to say when he was working with his family in order to provide money for all the devotees to come to Bengal, was capturing his heart just as much. So we're really here about Sita, who is the goddess of virtue. We can see it this way. I was just before class, by Krishna's grace, I was chanting out in that other room, one next to the next room. Incredible paintings of Ramayana in that room. I think that's where we show movie projectors. There's a movie screen, and there's just chairs. 
satisfied if we get more. But actually it just aggravates the situation. Gita tells like a fight, the more fuel you put in by trying to satisfy it, the hotter and more hungry it becomes. 
Krishna Prahlad describes it in another way. So trying to satisfy these material desires are like trying to satisfy an itch by scratching it. Do you know what poison ivy is? Poison, I don't know what it's called. <coughs> but, but it's a certain, like a leaf, that's a weed. And if you do touch it, you get a big rash. <coughs> it really, really itches. And if you scratch it, it makes it worse. The only way to get rid of it is you have to stop scratching. And it spreads. If you scratch it, you can and then you touch somewhere, then it grows here. <laughs> when you accidentally touch here, that's <laughs> the what is it called here? We don't have any penitent. Yeah? There, there is, I don't know what it's called. There is a sign. Anyway, it's in America. It's a sign. 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 But you know when a child has it? Because I have it. You know, you're playing in the forest and you accidentally just touch it and then all of a sudden this big rash and it itches so bad. It's just, it just drives you crazy. And when you scratch it, it feels so good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like, it's itching. And then you scratch it. <laughs> but then when you stop scratching it, you have to keep scratching it harder and harder and harder because as you're scratching it, it's becoming redder and redder and redder and more intense and then it's, it itches ten times more after you scratch it. And the only result of the only, then you try to scratch it again even more enthusiastically and as you're scratching, you just keep scratching and scratching. You can't stop scratching. You become addicted like a scratch addict. <laughs> 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 so when you're a little child, your parents tie your hands up. They tie your hands up so you can't scratch it. Because that's the only way you can let it. You have to tolerate it. There's a pink lotion called Caroline Lotion. You put it on it. It kind of soothes it. But the only cure is to not scratch it. So you have to kind of tie your kids hands up. Tolerate this if you're an adult. Nobody's going to tie your hands if you tolerate, tolerate. Put some medicine on it. And then it goes away. And so Dr. Prahlad Maharaj says all lust and all these desires for, for enjoyment are just like an itch in trying to, in trying to find relief from material suffering and trying to enjoy trying to enjoy lusty desires is just like scratching the itch. It makes it worse. <coughs> so Radha, so Barnaby knew, he was totally addicted to scratching the itches. And because he had so much power and so much fame and so much wealth, he had so much ego, he was thinking, everything should be mine. You don't think about others, you just think everything is revolving around me. If I'm happy, then the universe is fine. <laughs> if I'm not happy, then the universe is all wrong. That's what the ego does. Suparika started describing the beauty of Sita and the qualities of Sita. And she said, I wanted to bring Sita back for you to enjoy. Only for you, because I'm such a self-assertive you. Because I knew only you will be happy with the beauty and the charms of Sita and yours. But in the process of trying to bring Sita back to you, they cut off my nose. She 
definitely misrepresented the facts. <laughs> <laughs> Just hearing about her, Ravana, she has to be mine. And he went to Maricha, who's a sage in the forest. And Maricha had already met Ram twice before. He was defeated, and he was really afraid of Ram. He was living as a hermit in the forest, incognito, in fear of Ram. Because he was Subabu and Maricha were the two people who were disturbing Vishwamitra Muni's yajyas when Ram was just a little teenager. Yeah. Because Subaru, <laughs> Ram shot an arrow. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of his life. But from Maricha, Ram wanted to teach him a good lesson. Hit <laughs> 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 him in the chest. And Ram, when he wants to make an arrow do something extraordinary, Thank you.